welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, Stephanie Ott from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, CZI, joins me and we'll discuss the challenges are accelerating the pace of scientific discovery. I think that tools and tech are going to be one of the key critical pieces to actually accelerating um, the pace of scientific discoveries. A wide range of hobbies, from backpacking to hiking, even skydiving with a mother. I've uh, been skydiving a few times and I took my, my mom um, for her for birthday. <laughs> the vital importance of coffee. I need it every morning to be able to exist. <laughs> it's absolutely required. And the importance of effective communication in science. So I think when, when people have a common goal that they're working towards, like a lot of really amazing things can happen. And I think communicating what that goal is and why it's important is a, a critical piece in the and doing this. All in this episode of The Microscopist. Okay, uh, welcome to The Microscopist. And today I'm joined by Stephanie Ott from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So before, do you know what would be really good to start with is actually knowing what the CZI, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, actually is. So Stephanie, could you start by explaining about that, please. Yeah, happy to. So the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative um, was started by Dr. Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg. Um, They have this broad mission um, to cure, prevent, or manage all disease um, by the turn of the century, which is a a pretty lofty, lofty goal. So I'm part of the the science initiative, um, and we focus on this this broader goal. Um, And right now, we're focused on accelerating the the pace of scientific discovery. Um, The philanthropy can work um, in kind of interesting ways. So it's kind of a unique philanthropy. So you can um, send grants, you know, so you can grant money to individuals or labs or organizations, um, other foundations. but we also have a technology arm. So we build tools and tech, um, and we also try to work closely and collaborate with our our grantees. So there's a lot of community development and capacity building. Um, So we use all of these different uh, modes um, to be able to reach uh, particular objectives. So I I am familiar with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to start with, but for those that aren't, it's not, it's quite broad in where you fund and there's different arms within the CZI of of what type of things you fund and and one of those is the imaging the microscopy or imaging is it imaging or microscopy which is it imaging Um, microscopy rolls up into to imaging so first we started in microscopy but now it's pretty broad and covers uh, a lot of biomedical imaging um, techniques okay so uh, MRI and things like that as well yeah, okay. MRI, photoacoustic, ultrasound, uh, PET imaging, electron microscopy, light microscopy, the full, full range. <laughs> so this is really different to, to many funding streams, whether it be charities or whether it be government funding, uh, national funding streams. Very few are just on technology. And yet here you are having a whole sort of, sort of I, I know, set of money, funds, just for the technology itself. So what, what's the motivation behind that? I mean, I, th- I think that tools and tech are going to be one of the key critical pieces to actually accelerating um, the pace of scientific discovery. So we need the tools to be able to actually visualize biological processes, to be understand um, health and disease. And so I think it's really important to accelerate the pace and the adoption of tools and techniques um, more broadly. Um, and I think it's going to be a key piece to be able to, to reach this, this broader goal for the initiative. You know, I, I, no, I can very much see that. So in the UK, certainly the, our funding bodies have done special initiatives, one-offs, uh, and have broader ones for technology. But this is, you know, this is continuous. Uh, and I think that's really good. And I, I, I would bet that you get more applications because it is defined 
people realize it is for them and coming yeah. with it. But you must get lots of questions from potential appli applicants asking if it's relevant. Is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, we definitely get a number of questions. Um, I mean, we've been funding a lot of you know, imaging scientists and tool developers and image analysts and community um, organizers have been a lot of who we've been funding as part of the program. And I would say there hasn't been a lot of grants that have been directed towards these people before. So sometimes you even hear that they're reading it and they're just like surprised this like actually describes them to a T and they, <laughs> they're able to apply for a grant specifically for the work that they're doing. Um, so the imaging program in particular, it's less funding for uh, research scientists and more for these um, other um, important folks within the, the broader ecosystem. So I think that's really important actually. So at, at the very start you mentioned how technology is so important for driving science but it's not just the development of the technology. Uh, so what you've just said it's almost about bringing the community together and community initiative to support the application of technology as well. So do you have good examples around that of what you supported that wouldn't ordinarily find funding within ordinary streams? Yeah, so right now we're funding imaging scientists that operate open access imaging facilities around the world. Um, and so we're supporting um, salaries of the imaging scientists and we bring them together um, for regular meetings and encourage collaboration and to tackle some of the biggest challenges um, that the imaging community faces. We also fund uh, umbrella organizations like Global Bioimaging and Bioimaging North America. And we fund um, frontiers projects, so technology development projects, but we actually incentivize as part of the, the program, uh, collaboration amongst the grantees. So in a phase two, they can flip teams and apply for potentially more money um, to be able to, to work together and collaborate on exciting new technology development projects. So you, you, you kindly sent some pictures and this picture I presume is, uh, is a picture of your imaging scientists, uh, which I guess one advantage of COVID is uh, you had the chance to get perfect pictures of everyone at once and no one hiding behind the back, I guess. So <laughs> yeah. I, if I move so everyone can be seen, it's a lot of scientists. How many have you funded to date? Oh, geez. Um, so for the imaging program, so we have the, the imaging scientist program. I think there's 40 scientists and two umbrella organizations associated with that. Um, and then we have the frontiers work. Um, so this is new technology development uh, for deep tissue imaging. Um, there's a visual proteomics one that will be announced soon. So there's about 30 um, total um, that will that we're funding as part of that. And then we fund software developers um, and are building out a software analysis tool internally. Um, we'll be announcing microgrants for the community. So yeah, I would say overall, you know, 100 or so within the imaging community more broadly. I should know this number. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're it's growing it's, it's, rapidly. <laughs> once you're up around 100, I, I think it, it becomes irrelevant if it's yeah, 90 or 110, it's, it's, it's significant. And, and you brought up some interesting points, which we'll come to a bit later. How much in the way, what, what I, I, I don't know this answer. What is the funding range, low cost to high cost? What is sort of the cost involved um, in individual project? Yeah, so the imaging program, so the, um, uh, for the imaging scientists, we fund their salaries for five years. Um, so there's a, a range of salaries uh, provided <laughs> for the imaging scientists. And then for um, some of our Frontiers projects, um, for deep tissue imaging, we awarded each group $1 million. Um, uh, second round of funding could be up to $10 million um, uh, to uh, accelerate the adoption of the technology. Um, so that would probably be kind of at our, our high end uh, for an individual grant is around 10 million. See, see now I'm thinking about what I could do. <laughs> I've, I've got to concentrate on this, haven't I? Not, not thinking about what I want to do uh, and what that could enable, because that, that really is, yeah, quite something. Stephanie, if we just go back a moment, what is your role uh, within the initiative? 
So I am the science officer for the imaging program. And the role of the science officer is to set strategy and oversee execution of the initiatives. Um, so you determine uh, where we're going to, to focus, um, what RFAs or what tools or tech we should develop, um, and then um, make sure that the people, um, the correct people are funded, or we build up proper teams internally um, to be able to, to meet the goals, um, our strategic goals. And how, I, I, I'm sure a lot of people will argue that you haven't chose the right things, or you, you, or you have chose the right things. I know there's certainly 100 people that say you definitely did choose the right things. There'll be some that say, well, actually, maybe you should be looking in different areas. How do you come to those decisions? I mean, this is really a collaboration. So we listen to the community. That's first. Um, one of our values at CZI is to be close to the work. Um, so we we host uh, regular workshops with the community, invite people in. We hear about the challenges and opportunities. Um, we have advisors. So we have an advisory board internally. Um, the imaging program just assembled an advisory board. Um, we'll be announcing this soon, but we listen a lot um, to, to the broader community. And then we think through like, what is the effort um, to be able to do something? Um, and then what's the potential impact? So you have to measure those two things. A lot of things could be high effort uh, <laughs> and low impact. And those are obviously not the ones <laughs> you want to choose to get started with. <laughs> when you talk about the community, is this all academics or do you have industry involved in these conversations? Um, some industry partners involved in, in conversations, especially on the tech development side. Um, so there's a certain point in which uh, technology will be developed in academic um, institutions, and then we're thinking through broader dissemination. I think this will be a more important point as we move through phase two of the Frontiers projects. Um, um, you know, and we're we're also going to host a workshop on open hardware as well to understand challenges and opportunities. What we care about really is broad dissemination. Um, so that is our goal, and we can think through all of the avenues for for broad dissemination and the challenges associated with it, um, okay. and determine best path. So you're in this role, uh, having to weigh up all these voices, opinions. Some that will have vested interests, other that will be very holistic in there. What, what they feel in the community needs, even if it isn't uh, in their remit. Uh, so it's quite difficult to, I, I guess, to come to decisions. But what is your background to start with? I'm a neuroscientist um, by training. Um, so I was, I studied systems neuroscience. Um, and then oh, this is a, <laughs> a picture of me at, uh, I, after grad school and postdoc, I was director of science in a neurotech uh, startup um, that was a spin out out of Stanford. So we uh, developed these little miniaturized microscopes that uh, could be implanted um, into so the animal would wear it on the head, there would be a little Bren lens or an endoscope um, that would be implanted into specific brain regions. And then you could visualize the uh, ensemble activity um, via calcium dynamics. Um, and so I ran a lab there and a application and translation team. Um, so that is where I sort of made this bridge from neuroscience uh, more focused into, into imaging um, at, before I came to, to CCI. So you have, so, yeah, so, so I guess you are an imager. You, you've got the perfect background, uh, both from an academic sense and seeing business and the ad adaptation of technology and the need for it. You go, I've, got to, well, I've got to go back to that picture, actually. What is in your hand? <laughs> That's my... That's a little mouse wearing wearing the microscope. So the, the cool thing about this is you get dynamic pictures, live pictures of information transmission within the brain. So you could study sensory processing or you could study um, a range of different uh, tech or uh, uh, paradigms. And you could actually watch uh, the neurons fire, fire in real time and then try to decode their activity. So you try to see how the brain encodes um, information. Um, and it was a, a pretty cool job. Before this, it was funny. I was an uh, electrophysiologist and I was recording like a single individual neuron at a time. And then here you could view like a thousand neurons at once. And so the, the amount of information you could obtain was <laughs> amazing. <laughs> hey, okay, so it's a pretty cool job. Why change? Why go into this role? I am a 
challenge seeker, I think. Um, so it's like, uh, this role came up. I had colleagues that I knew that were um, at Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So I switched over about two years ago and they were looking for somebody um, to uh, you know, run the imaging program. And I was looking through the, um, <laughs> the uh, job responsibilities and the type of person they were looking for. And I was like, this sounds a lot like me, <laughs> um, which, was, which was kind of fun. Um, and so I, you know, is a mission driven organization that could have broad global impact um, and the leadership of the science org um, was really inspiring to me. So I made the leap and jumped over. <laughs> it, it, it is a big jump because you're no longer in the lab itself. Yeah. And do you miss that aspect? I don't. So it. Uh, my old company. I wasn't doing lab work as much anymore, but I do miss interacting with data. I really like doing um, data analysis. <laughs> so I, uh, that part I miss, um, but I don't miss um, experimentation, to be honest. <laughs> that, was, that was never my favorite part. <laughs> gotcha. So I'm, I'm going to move on to the importance of data, actually. It's, it's a good, it's a good uh, segue into it. Imaging. You're getting lots of different data from lots of different modalities. How important is data analysis in, in these technologies? I mean, it's the critical piece and the critical bottleneck for almost all of these imaging technologies. Um, and also one of the, the broad focus areas of the, the imaging program. Um, so first we started with uh, funding some uh, software fellows that are working on key open source software packages for the imaging community. Um, but then we've also been putting a lot of resources internally and developing an open source platform ourselves. Um, so it's a, a multi-dimensional image viewer um, called Napari um, that can harness the, the Python ecosystem. And then we are um, incentivizing and working with the community to build out uh, plugins um, and um, analysis workflows. Um, um, so uh, I think it's it's going to be one of these key pieces um, that we're going to need to solve. And you can't just develop the technology without thinking through enabling the ability to extract quantitative insights from the data. So I guess that's going to be bringing in mathematicians, computer scientists as well. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, and part of the, in the future too. So one thing that we'll be um, uh, announcing soon and opening up is a um, microgrants for plugin developers um, and algorithm developers. And we could continue on this thread in the years to come, making sure mathematicians and <laughs> algorithm developers are part of the broader community and also incentivize um, to do their work and rewarded um, and recognized for the work that they do. I think that's an, an important part too, is to making sure that people get the recognition they deserve. I, I'm going to be really cheeky. I, I've, I've had a meeting with my PhD students and actually she's a math computer science mathematician uh, and, and she's got a load of code and we, we're just going to back to publish with it. And we say, well, how are we going to make this available? And the code, we say, well, what we'd really like to do is move it between different coding platforms. So converters, and that would be really useful. So yeah. whichever platform they're written it in to be able to transfer it in, so it can go into ImageJ or other open source platforms yeah. to be able to access easily. Is that on your radar? Um, we're starting um, to discuss this more and more. There are some groups that are working on compatibility between um, platforms. We haven't directly incentivized this, but we keep hearing this. And so these are these are important things. When we hear something regularly from the community, um, a lot of times we have to explore it more and then figure out ways to incentivize it or to actually make it happen. Uh, it, it's, and, and the more people, will, certainly that I'm talking to at different uh, about different elements of microscopy imaging or just science in general actually so Ottilene Liza is is the chief executive for UKRI so essentially on the government science funding and very much AI uh, deep learning and really exploiting the data uh, and yeah. extrapolating that it is where it needs to be yeah I still think it's a long way off and how do yeah. we persuade computer scientists that their career should be in science. 
as well <laughs> in bio, in life sciences and for technology development rather than exploiting the stock market. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of those hard things. We even find this at, at CZI. So it's the, the recruitment of software engineers too in Silicon Valley, because this is where we're, we're based or when we're talking about mathematicians or algorithm developers. Um, I mean, I think that the, the biggest thing is uh, you want mission aligned uh, people. Um, so um, a lot of times you have to be selective, but it has to be people that really believe in the broader mission and want to um, do something good for the world. Um, and could, um, yeah, align align with the mission and uh, find a lot of motivation for that because I think the the cost and salary differences, you know, can be substantial. So <coughs> just just to give, I, I won't help those listening to the audio, but some of the images that can come out of the microscopes are stunning. So you you, just, you sent this image. I can't remember exactly which one it is, but it looks like a neuronal network, maybe of some sort. I think this is uh, Song Yu from uh, Washington University. This is looking at blood flow using uh, photoacoustic um, techniques, um, which is pretty cool. So using the combination of, of light and sound here. Um, so it looks good and sounds good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. the, the complexity of that image, the eyes are so good at following, tracing, seeing where junctions, seeing where connections are being made. And yet software still really struggles with that type of analysis. Uh, and it's that, that complexity. By the way, these make some of the best Zoom backgrounds around. I also like this one. I know. <laughs> yeah, this is Karen Jacobs from uh, uh, um, and. I think she's in South Africa. So they study a lot of infectious disease and it's a T cell um, and HIV infecting uh, T cell. So I think the magenta is the um, HIV particles and the cyan is the T cell receptors is what you're seeing. Um, but yeah, that's one of our imaging scientists that we're supporting. But yeah, they send amazing pictures all the time. <laughs> I, I, like the fact I love it. And videos, videos too. We get lots of really cool videos uh, from our <laughs> from our broader community. <laughs> but being this is infection, I don't know if I really want to be in the center of this. That just makes me seem really <laughs> Yeah. I, I go on one more because this is just eye candy, isn't it? What's this image? This is gorgeous. This is uh, um, Brian Kabeen um, using diffusion MRI, and you're looking at uh, hippocampal um, slice and the rat brain and looking at uh, white matter tracks, um, which is pretty cool. So, yeah, we're supporting people that are developing computational techniques for um, MRI technologies as well. I think, you know, there, there are three examples that just show just how different the problems are that are being solved or being studied using imaging and those different modalities. What about the importance of linking those modalities? Because obviously, you know, they each one can address a different question, but put them together, would that not make it even more powerful? Yeah, and I think that's a lot of what we're doing in our frontiers initiatives. Um, we see a lot of combination of modalities. Um, so visual proteomics, um, what we will be funding a lot is not just on um, cryo-electron tomography to be able to visualize uh, um, near atomic resolution um, inside the cellular environment, but also uh, correlative light and electron microscopy techniques. And we see it a lot in our frontiers initiative associated with deep tissue imaging. So we have all these different technologies sort of pointed at the same goal um, to be able to get high resolution imaging, cellular resolution imaging deep into tissue. Um, so you have photoacoustic approaches and ultrasound approaches, MRI, X-ray, all sort of pointed toward the same goal. And we're actually seeing <laughs> pretty interesting collaborations now forming um, between the groups that you wouldn't have expected. Um, and so, yeah, I think it is critically important and to build like a, a mechanistic understanding of the way a biological system works. Um, a lot of times we have to see the system at multiple levels or multiple scales and um, be able to, to build a, a dynamic picture um, of, of what's happening. Um, and sometimes you have to do that with static shots <laughs> over time. Do, do you ever fund equipment itself? Um, we do, we don't have calls to fund equipment itself as part of our Frontiers initiative. If we see that there's a 
particular piece of equipment that would help the broader group um, move, yeah. we will fund that equipment as part of the, the initiative. Because, you know, you rattled off the MRIs, you then went down to the cryo EMs, and then you go down to the, the, the more classic light microscopes, and there's big price discrepancies between them. And I, I, I guess some people listening, watching won't know the price differences, but actually, I know a confocal maybe, I don't know, $500,000, for example, but yeah. a cryo EM will be maybe a couple of million dollars. Like and, and a half million. <laughs> right, and an MRI. Yeah. I'm uh, I don't know the yeah because we haven't funded any equipment and they have the range you know with the um, different magnetic strengths um, so yeah off the top of my head I don't know the, the full range of cost for MRI but yeah it's it's in the millions I believe um, yeah and and then a question that many researchers ask is like wow you you know you you'll spend maybe seven and a half million dollars on a on a cryo EM how much funding could you do in other areas, isn't that more important than using this technology that costs so much just to put the microscope in? How, how is that? How, how do you communicate why that's so important? Well, I think a lot of times when the technology is pretty expensive, um, what happens for the scientific community is it gets housed in common, common facilities um, that multiple researchers have access to. So it could actually open up a broad range of, of applications. And this is exactly what our imaging scientists do. They're, they, are how, they are running these open access imaging facilities and making sure to support the broad range of applications. So instead of funding the technology itself, we're funding the people that support that technology and trying to expand the range of applications um, that are opened up. Yeah, I think that's a really, so, so my day job is running a, a core facility, a shared resource, and the importance of maximizing the benefits for many, just like you had all those different sciences, you had the brains, you had the bloods, you had the infection. And actually the techniques can be applied to most of those different questions. And so being able to share it, it is really important. And that, that's certainly, yeah, certainly my area that I'm, I'm passionate about yeah. and making sure that those roles, because they're not classic academic roles, but they are yeah. equally, I, I would, I, of course I would argue this, I guess, you know, they're still very academic in their mindset. They still have to have the same expertise, the skills, but now have to, instead of just to using it to address one question, it's all in the technology and being able to turn it to different technologies. And, and so thank you actually for funding so many of the initiatives that, that supports that grouping of people and making sure they're well recognized. Uh, yeah, again, we're really proud to support them. Yeah, it's uh, an amazing group of people. <laughs> Do you know what I think it makes not just a difference to their awareness, I think it gives them some more pride in their job and the acknowledgement that it exists. Uh, UK, I will, I will champion UK at this point. I know the technicians commitment from our research councils and Hidden Ref are all there really to highlight this importance and their careers are being recognised, which is great. But I think the funding initiatives to enable them to get funding to support those is, is also really important, especially globally. Exactly. Uh, on the international scale. So, exactly. what has been the biggest challenge to date? Uh, start start with actually in your whole career. What has been your biggest challenge to date? In my whole career, I am just like I seek challenge. So it's always uh, like I always want to work on something that is complex and complicated and difficult to get off the ground. Um, so I would say I regularly um, work uh, to <laughs> I seek out these challenges and in, in everything that that I do. Um, you know, it, it's CZI. Um, you know, you came in and was like, uh, the imaging um, was a strategic direction that uh, CZI was going to focus on. But what do you focus on? What do you fund? What do you get off the ground? Um, you know, it was a was a big challenge to develop, the you know, a full strategic framework um, for what we're going to invest in or build. Um, but it was it was a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 so I guess actually you sent me some personal pictures as well and thinking <laughs> of challenges. You know, when you think about building uh, pyramids, so he, I presume, you must be obviously in Egypt at this point, either, I, it's, yeah. or either that in some studio somewhere. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. 
I was pretty big into uh, traveling um, prior to kids. So I did a lot of like backpacking and traveling um, around the world. <laughs> but just think about the logistics that they would have had to overcome yeah. to, to solve this. And in the time that I guess they'd have had to build a pyramid is a, in a timely manner. Uh, yeah. Personally, I think riding a camel is pretty challenging to start with. <laughs> the camel was not very nice to me. <laughs> getting up and down on them is, is not yeah the most trivial thing uh in the world i think it would be fair to say at that point but you said you like challenges this this picture go on you describe this picture you know more about this than i do obviously uh yeah this was uh skydiving so i've um, been skydiving a few times and i took my my mom um for her her birthday <laughs> one year which wow. was brave mom at that point yeah so, yeah, and, yeah. and your life's been in free fall ever since. No, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With a nice soft parachute landing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at th- that time. So you said traveling. This is another, I think, of you traveling. Yeah, just in uh, Japan. So I went there um, with my husband. Um, of, I don't know how long ago that picture was. But yeah, um, lots of traveling and backpacking. <laughs> Ah, so so backpacking would this be? Yeah, so this was one of these. Uh, where, I don't even know where I'm at. At some place, I think this was in um, California. But a lot of times, where you would hike through the the night um, to be able to reach a uh, peak um, at sunrise, but it was super foggy. <laughs> As I was about to say, <laughs> the, the, the view looks <laughs> pretty typical of anyone who climbs a mountain. As you get to the top, it's sunny at the bottom. You get to the top, you're just in cloud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but you look thoughtful at least in the picture yeah. <laughs> I think that's uh that's why I like hiking and other things like that it's uh a nice time for thinking <laughs> but you still get time to do it not as no um well right now with COVID um not traveling at all um for the job, that was one of the cool aspects of the this job is uh, the ability to to travel more. Um, so, <laughs> at the beginning, I was doing a fair a fair amount of traveling and had some pretty cool um, trips that were planned. Um, but right now, we've been at home since February of last year, and will not go back into the offices until twenty twenty two. So, two years at home. How, how long have you been with CZI? two years okay so gosh yeah so <laughs> over a year the majority of, <laughs> yeah the majority of the time now has been working from home <laughs> yeah no, that that that's bad timing i was gonna I, 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 do you know there's something that's just realized czi i don't know if carl's eyes know this but actually their files on their confocals are czi files so, i know it's so funny point. we get that confusion <laughs> yeah, <sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant advertising by Zeiss for you or vice versa. I don't know which way it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Cass, we're at, uh, coming back to work a bit. What has been the biggest frustration at work since working at CZI? What, what, have there been points where you think, gosh, I just wish we could do this faster or I wish this wasn't a problem? Where's been your biggest frustration? I'm trying to think. Like, I have loved this job um, and it was. Uh, I don't know. I feel like I've been able, um, or collectively we've been able to get, you know, big initiatives off the ground. Um, I think sometimes, you know, you're working in a pretty complex environment with multi-stakeholder interest. Um, and so you have to get a lot of alignment, um, across a number of individuals to, to be able to accomplish something. Um, it, it can be challenging, but I also find it incredibly rewarding. Um, which is pretty typical. The the most challenging things always end up being the, the most rewarding yeah, things. Okay. So you're so positive. Uh, <laughs> so just keep on the positive then. What's been the most fun moment you've had so far at CZI? Most fun moments. I think it, so this was like week three on the, the job, um, like week two or week three. And, uh, I needed to uh, present to um, Dr. Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg about what the, the strategy of the imaging program would be. <laughs> so it was like fresh on the job. Um, 
And that was, that was such a fun conversation. And they like encouraged, uh, um, need to think bigger and more broad and like push the frontiers of imaging. So I was like, okay, this job is going to be fun. <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed that. Now, how often do you get to, or how often do you get to talk to them, meet with them? Priscilla that... really involved in the, yeah. the organization across everything. So she, it's a, her daily job, you know, so um, any broad initiative that we get off the ground, um, you know, Priscilla is involved in approval um, and discussing implications of those broad initiatives. So Priscilla is very involved and, and Mark um, is involved on kind of a regular check-in um, cadence uh, across the, the initiatives. Uh, but yeah, Priscilla, um, when we were in the office, we saw her on you know nearly a daily basis. Yeah. I'll forgive you for saying that's been the most fun moment and not actually recording this with me, but you haven't finished this yet. <laughs> <laughs> this this of course <laughs> yes so they've encouraged you to think bigger broader but where's it going yeah so right now what we have a couple of things that we're focused on um so um you know we've uh, funded a bunch of the imaging scientists uh, around the globe, and we're trying to expand now um, global access to bioimaging. So we will be announcing an initiative um, really soon where we're actually trying to expand access to uh, imaging technologies and infrastructure and uh, plug in um, uh, groups from uh, low expenditure, low country expenditure on research and development. Um, so these will target Africa and Latin America um, and sort of broadening uh, what the global uh, imaging community is. That's one, one big thing. Um, then tech development projects and analysis tools uh, will be big focus areas for us. That's a conversation for off air as well, because that, that, that sounds really cool. Uh, and I think yeah. there's a lot more facilities out there. That yeah, I would love to chat well. about that more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so actually, you talked about your scientists. So this is Michelle, I think. Yeah, Michelle Latano at yeah. UNC. She's she's fantastic. But I love Michelle. On, 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 <laughs> I, you know, I, on a microscope, that's all I can say. I can't see. I, I, can't, yeah, see. I can't. Uh, I, I think in this yeah, case, I'll... I do. Yeah. What, I'm sorry? Yeah, so, so so actually, I can say in this point, she's got a CZI file behind her. <laughs> she looked oh. close. <laughs> yeah. so, so that bit by coincidence. Uh, but you have many others. What? What's? I think this is Sarah McArdle from uh, La Jolla Institute of Immunology. Um, yeah, so I think that they study a range of uh, infectious disease there. Um, and then looking at like inflammatory, um, uh, responses. So it's like a, a range of inflammatory disorders. And then obviously I actually, I don't know what these, you've sent me a couple of group photos. So, yeah, this was from one of our frontiers. Um, so what I was talking about before is that we, a lot of times we host these exploratory events. So we bring in thought leaders from around the field. And I believe this is one um, that we were focused on uh, looking at the challenges and opportunities related to electron um, microscopy with a focus on uh, cryo-electron um, tomography. Where was it? Where was it held? This is a Biohub, CZ Biohub, which is... Uh, in San Francisco, and it's a, a meeting or a convergence place for a lot of the, the Bay Area universities, Stanford, Berkeley, UCSF. Um, and then there's a group of researchers that work at the Biohub um, and uh, focus on uh, a number of uh, technology development and research projects. And a different group? Yeah, so this is... Uh, also a Frontiers workshop. So this one, we invited people from uh, focusing on a range of different um, techniques. But this uh, group was, uh, and some of the ideas that came out of here is why we decided to focus on um, deep tissue imaging. Um, so uh, there were some really cool technologies that the, the group was presenting on, and we, we decided uh, this would be a fantastic area uh, to support, um, which is 
a lot of fun. <laughs> so a lot of people have a lot of thanks to those those groups that, that are there. <laughs> and uh, and this group. Ah, those are my boys. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> those are. Um, I have two sons, uh, age three and five. Uh, so those are my my boys. They're they're quite a bit of fun too. <laughs> too young yet to realize that they're going to be scientists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> maybe scientists. So, how do you balance? You've got two, three. Yeah, do you know? What? I, I bet your lockdown's probably not been a bad thing. Uh, in some respects, you probably had more time with them, being around at least. But how have you yeah. coped uh, having the two young children? So they, they will be de- demanding and having this job. Yeah. yeah, I would say right now the you know personal time. Uh, <laughs> It was pretty low. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I don't know. They, um, yeah, it can be difficult and challenging. I mean, I'm lucky I have like a, a great, um, partner. Um, so, uh, they're, you know, dad's actively involved. So we've just been, um, making it work. Um, they were able to, um, we were able to find a a hybrid uh, approach for the older one and full-time daycare for the younger one, which is good. Um, so we're both still able to work, but yeah, juggling. Um, (laughs) I think everyone (laughs) at this point and parents of young children are, are used to, to figuring out how to, how to juggle life (laughs) and make it work. Yeah. And, and, and how to, uh, yeah, maximize everything they can though in children as well to get the attention and time. <clears throat> so who, who cooks at home then? We split the task. Um, so we, I used to love, I used to love cooking. I, I found a lot of enjoyment. Now we're very like structured. It's like crock pot Monday, taco Tuesday. <laughs> we have a, a list. Um, and so, yeah, my husband and I split, um, split the duty and we have specific days that we cook on. Um, he gets grill day on, on Sunday, which is, uh, really nice, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we, we basically split all, all tasks at home. But so who's the better cook? I think he is, I think he's more like experimental. Um, and, uh, yeah, a lot of times it turns out really good. <laughs> yeah, so what's his, what's his best dish that he cooks? I think this like seared salmon um, that he makes with this orange Tabasco sauce uh, is delicious. <laughs> I really like that one. And what about yourself? What's your signature dish? What's your... Oh, geez. What is my signature dish? I've been so bland lately. <laughs> Because it's also cooking for a three and a five year old. It's uh, <laughs> anything with spice or anything. Yeah, I like. Um, uh, I don't. I don't know what my signature dish would be. I liked uh, Thai and sushi and other things like that. Um, but I haven't made that in a while. <laughs> no, it's so what about uh, eating out? Would you rather eat out or eat in? eat out that much um well especially with COVID and then with kids yeah um we did definitely enjoy going to a nice restaurant forging a little every once in a while um but yeah I would say almost the majority of our our meals are are in and we cook um yeah okay. almost are you coffee or tea what's your favorite coffee <laughs> Be. espresso or espresso americano cappuccino americano yeah, okay. straight coffee. That's, that's the longest. <laughs> I need it every morning to be able to exist. <laughs> it's absolutely required. Yeah, I, I like that question. Espresso to Americano is the longer and short of it, isn't it? Really. Uh, <laughs> what about wine or beer? Wine and whiskey. Whiskey. I was about to go <laughs> wine or spirit or wine or cocktail, so whiskey. Gotch. So Scotch whiskeys, bourbons, bourbons. I like bourbons. I like Scotch too, but bourbons, bourbons have like a special place for me. Okay. <laughs> and what about so to chill out in the evening? Would you read a book? Would you watch TV? Watch a movie? Say we'd like uh, play outside. Um, uh, so take the kids outside. Go for hikes. Go for walks. Um, yeah, uh, we enjoy having outdoor time. Uh, quite a bit. Um, so I think that's one of my favorite things to do is 
get the boys outside. Plus it gets their energy out with two, <laughs> two young boys. <laughs> it's really important. <laughs> okay. So what do you watch on TV at the moment? You've got two young children. Not, I mean, they watch some things that I just don't enjoy at all. Um, so they enjoy little cartoons and whatnot. Um, I like more sci-fi and dark comedy um, and a lot of what I enjoy watching. I can't really watch around my children. So <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> yeah, 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 sci-fi and dark comedy. Yeah, maybe, maybe not the best combination. What about reading? Yeah. Do you read books? I, I used to read quite a bit. Like I, I liked sci-fi too. Like my favorite yeah. authors, um, Kurt Vonnegut. Um, I really enjoyed his, uh, a lot of his, his work. Um, but yeah, lately I haven't been doing a lot of reading that isn't for work. Um, uh, yeah, just time. It hasn't really permitted it. <laughs> and what about music? Oh yeah. A whole range of music, um, that I enjoy. Um, but I think my kids have now monopolized, uh, <laughs> all of, <laughs> they, they like kids pop, um, which is, uh, remakes, of uh, popular songs. And now I listen to that and it plays in my head <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> I'll enjoy it when they expand their, their musical taste. <laughs> so, you know, right I've, I've, not, I've never asked anyone. Do you like to work with music on in the background or silence in the background? Uh, uh, silence. Yeah. Silence. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Unless, yeah. unless when I was doing uh, analysis, um, like if I was uh, trying to analyze data, then I would put music on in the background and try to like um, tune out the entire world. Um, but yeah. I think that has it. So go on. Night owl or early bird? Early bird. For sure. <laughs> Early bird. How uh, how early is early? Um, I'm up around five Ooh. every morning. Is that a West Coast phenomena? So you sort of match more of East Coast. I grew up on a farm. It's a farm phenomena. <laughs> like my entire family was like early risers. No one slept in. Like if the sun was up, you were up. It was just like unacceptable to sleep in if the sun. So you're not a night owl as well? If I'm working on something, like I love working into the night. If it's like a complex um, problem that I'm trying to solve or like a strategy trying to lay it out, um, then I'll stay up um, pretty late into the night. It's like where I can get my best thinking done. Um, mm. But I try not to do that too often so I can actually get some sleep. <laughs> and what's your, uh, so, so a couple more quick questions actually. What's your pet hate? What's my oh hate? hate. Um, yeah, like, like what annoys me the most? Yeah. Um, um, Don't say podcasts. In podcast, <laughs> uh, <laughs> chew when people chew gum when they're speaking to me. <laughs> <laughs> the sound or yeah, yeah. they uh, open their mouths when they're eating. No, yeah, Don't, yeah the sound of eating is not the best thing in the world, is it? No, it's <laughs> not. It really. Is. That's when music's really good. Dinner times, music. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. where you want the music. <laughs> yeah. And, and what do you most love? What, what's your favorite object in the house? My favorite object? Jeez. I don't know. Um, I don't even know what my favorite object. We have a favorite room. My husband and I have like an adult room where it's uh, like chill fireplace and nice furniture and nice artwork. And <laughs> we keep well, the kids out. That's They're like answer. not allowed in. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a yeah. good answer. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. that, that that's a very good answer. So we've talked a lot about communication and the importance of it, but why is it, yeah, from a CZI perspective uh, and science in general, why is communication so important? Well, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of when you're talking about um, accelerating the pace of scientific discovery um, and um, doing, or uh, like focusing on some of these common challenges, um, you need to have broad community buy-in. A lot of this is funded through, you know, taxpayer money, um, and, um, addressing, you know, community challenges. And so being able to articulate what you're doing, how it could impact, um, broader society, getting multiple people involved. I think when, when people have a common goal that they're working towards, like a lot of really, 
amazing things can happen. And I think communicating what that goal is and why it's important is a, a critical piece in the in doing this. And and is that just communicating between scientists or communicating to the broader population? Oh, to the broader population. Population. I think communication between scientists is clearly essential. Um, it's uh, a lot of times, you know, a problem or challenge that you're trying to address um, has been addressed or somebody else is thinking about it from, from a different angle. And so, you know, we focus a lot on community development and allowing our grantees um, to um, exchange information, exchange experience, um, and to build. But I also think it's really important to be able to communicate to the, to the broader um, public as well. And, you know, do you think all scientists appreciate that to the same degree? No, oh, of course. Of course, people, there's always a range of what people appreciate or what they think is, you know, important um, to do. So some scientists are excellent um, communicators and, you know, we do a lot of funding of what we call outreach activists, like people that really think about broader community initiatives and trying to bring a lot of people along. Um, but yeah, there's people that also really prefer to like focus in on their research question and would love it if they never had to, <laughs> to give a public talk. <laughs> so there's, there's a full range. And what about, you know, there's one thing about trying to get scientists to communicate to the, 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 the more the lay public, the uh, you know the general public at that point, but to a degree, some of them struggle to communicate amongst themselves uh, as well. And now it'd be interesting. You've got a lot of different awardees. Let's start off with the frontiers and the imaging scientists. How different are they in their personalities, attitudes? I, I, do they? Could you almost? If you were to do uh, some deconvolution, could you put them into their separate camps? You know, just talking to them, would you be able to put them into A or B, frontiers and imaging scientists? Or are they much closer than that? They're a lot closer than that, I think. Um, like where you couldn't just pick up on individual traits. Um, um, and there's a, a pretty big range. I mean, I do think that the imaging scientists are some of the most uh, collaborative, open um, uh, uh, scientists that I have worked with. So it's really an amazing community. So I do think that there's kind of a special, a special thing with the, <laughs> the imaging scientists um, in particular. Um, you can get some uh, tech developers that have those qualities, but a lot of times they'll be focused more on their particular question and get pretty deep into, you know, um, specific technological specifications and other things like that. So yeah. That would be fun to do. Yeah, cluster <laughs> analysis of scientists would be brilliant. That would be. <laughs> yeah. God, how just just thinking of the awardees in general how different are they what are the extremes uh, of the people you're working with i mean so it's interesting because the imaging program compared to the other initiatives are are pretty different you know on who we fund um so there's like a neurodegeneration group and a single cell and inflammation um that fund a lot of the uh individual researchers and are thinking through um you know career development for them they have a lot of focus on early stage investigators um a lot of who we fund are you know the people that run open um, access cores, uh, you know, um, tech developers. Um, yeah, so I think that a lot of the people we do fund, though, I mean, we keep a special eye out for people that focus on um, collaboration, too. Um, and I think as like being part of the, the network, um, we may focus on groups like this. But I don't know, there's a there's a range, but they're all they're all terrific. <laughs> I really I guess enjoy our, our group. I guess that's part of your role and the part of the CZO I role is to develop those networks and to nurture and encourage them uh, yeah. to a large extent. How open is it? So these networks, how, how do you get others outside of the funding network involved to, to hear their voices and to, to kind of make sure that those that are CZI funded are having wider impacts? Yeah. How, how is that enabled? Yeah, so... We're working on our community development plans now for, for imaging, but one of the, you know, for our imaging scientists, for instance, um, we do also fund these uh, 
uh, umbrella organizations like Global Bioimaging or Bioimaging North America um, that have larger um, oversights. And there's multiple uh, imaging cores or um, networks of uh, core facilities that engage uh, with these partners. Um, we're also talking about ways of making sure that we include um, the broader community. That's really important to us because we don't view it as just our the CZI imaging scientists as who we want to support. We want to support the broader, uh, um, you know, uh, imaging efforts um, around the globe. And so we're actively working and exploring. Um, ideas are also appreciated here of how to get others um, to, to actively work together. Um, we're interested in elevating their role. We're interested in getting additional funding uh, through government funding or through other foundations. Um, to us, it's really important that uh, these groups get spotlighted and um, more investment in imaging infrastructure and people occurs. And so I'm, I'm just writing notes for myself, actually, more than, more than outside, of, <laughs> outside of this podcast itself. Uh, I can't remember where I was going to go now. Oh, I can't believe no. it. <laughs> so, how much of the funding, this may be a difficult question to answer, I don't know, how much of the funding goes to US scientists, how much outside of the US? So our first round of imaging scientists was fully in the US. Um, second round uh, was global, so uh, people globally could apply. It was about a 50-50 split. The next round is all outside the US. Um, so everything that we will be funding, um, we're really focused on, again, these, these countries that have low expenditure on research and development. Um, so we'll be focusing exclusively on, on those groups. And then for our frontiers, there's a range. Um, so it's, it's all over the globe, um, but tends to be in you know, US, Europe. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so I, I know Kerry Thompson was one of the awardees with the most recent, I know Kerry, uh, very well through the Royal Microscopical Society. How do you justify having none in the US this time around? Um, well, we were taking a look at where, so we're trying to develop this global network. And I think it's really important to hear the voices of, you know, why people are using imaging technologies and what sort of applications they're trying to support uh, more broadly. Um, and you can take a map and look at like where the imaging scientists are, um, you know, that we have funded. And it was clear that there's just, you know, huge gaps. Um, like there's hardly anyone in Africa that we're funding, hardly anyone in, you know, uh, South America. Um, uh, in Asia, we have big gaps in Asia. And, and so we started talking with imaging scientists there, exploring it in more detail, having in-depth conversations, understanding what their needs are. And so, you know, we really want to make a targeted approach to, to bring these people into the, into the broader global community. We think it's really important um, that their voice is represented and heard. So I, I, this is not a, a set up question in any way. What do you feel the importance of social media is in all of this? Uh, I mean, I think social media is, you know, can allow, like a lot of people use Twitter for science, you know? So um, I think like my Twitter, like I'm not actively involved in social media, but I would say a lot of my colleagues, it's like Twitter science, you know? <laughs> like That's how they, they're exchanging uh, information, they get updated. Um, so I would say that's a pretty popular platform for, um, for scientists overall um, and can allow them to more broadly communicate um, widely. Yeah, no, I, I would fully agree. The reason for asking is there's a Twitter account, which I think is Imaging Africa, I think, which is certainly a microscopy orientated Twitter. Yeah. Like you could put in to try and disseminate some of the work into Africa itself. So, so there are already these sort of foundations. It's really making them, empowering them and enabling them. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. I think social yeah. media is important. I've got just one more work question, which is, have you ever got... Uh, any disgruntled customers that come back or maybe you didn't fund them or they've been criticized for some reason, have you had to cope with anything like that? I guess a little bit. Like some people, you know, um, may like wonder why um, they didn't get funded. And a lot of times, you know, it's, um, you know, the the labs or the the groups are really dependent upon the funding to be able to, to operate the facility or operate their lab. Um, and so we understand that. Um, 
but, you know, we go through kind of a, a vigorous process whenever we have an RFA and there's, you know, multiple rounds of external reviews. A lot of times we have a uh, panel meeting um, and they're, you know, competitive applications. So, um, yeah, a little bit. Um, but, you know, we understand where people are coming from and, you know, the need that they're trying to trying to address. It's a, yeah, I get in that point is a tough world. Yeah. Uh, when they're in that scenario, I guess if that's they're dependent, their jobs, the jobs of their staff are dependent on it. But but that's science. Uh, yeah. Whether that's right or wrong in science, that that's not something that is the funder's fault. That's the way science funds. You, you kind of live and die by your success and your vision of moving forward. But it can be a harsh world out yeah. there. I, I can imagine. I wouldn't be. I, I don't envy your position uh, of having. <laughs> go back and give them the bad news when it hasn't been said. Yeah. But we've all had it. We've all heard it. Uh, and yeah, best reaction is to come back stronger <laughs> just for the next application. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> On a more positive note, because I, I think we're coming up to the to the hour mark. I, I should have wrote down the time we started. So I think it's about an hour we're at, at the moment. So to end it on a more entertaining note, do you have a best job? <laughs> A best joke. Um, so this is my my son's favorite um, joke for for kindergarten. Um, what's green and has little yellow wheels? I don't know what's green and has little yellow wheels. Grass. I was just kidding about the little yellow wheels. <laughs> I like the humor. <laughs> and he gets favorite. that. I like the fact he even gets that joke. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can think of so many derivatives of that. That's pretty, I'm going to use that. I like that. <laughs> Tell your son he's got a really great joke. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Is there anything else you'd like to bring up before we finish? Anything you'd like to mention from a CZI perspective even? No, I don't. I don't think so. Definitely really enjoy it. I mean, we're just really interested in continuing working with the, the broader imaging community um, and, you know, expanding uh, their role and putting a focus on all the great work that everyone's doing. Um, and so we just want to to be able to continue doing this. And if anyone has an idea of what they think you should be funding or anything else, is, should they just email CZI? Should they email you? How should they contact you with ideas, suggestions, comments? Yeah, so we have a, if you go to the CZI um, uh, website and go to the imaging program, there's a, a contact information for um, the, the folks that work on the imaging program. So people are feel free to, to reach out. Um, we definitely read those. We take them into consideration. Um, yeah, so we'd love, love to hear from people. Okay, Stephanie, thank you very much. Before you go, I'd just like to say, to, for those who are listening, it's worth tuning into the YouTube just to see the images that were forwarded, the actual, because they, they really were mind-blowingly brilliant. And I do think that you should have a load of wallpapers that you can just send out for Zoom background because they, they are fantastic. Uh, I can't use them again, which I'm gutted because they really were brilliant to use. Uh, so again, yeah, thank you very much, Stephanie, for joining us. Thank you for listening to this version of the Microscopist. Please do subscribe to the channels and uh, I hope... Uh, you really enjoyed this one. Stephanie, you've been brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.